Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We have to try this mic out. Uh, is it uh, audible in the last row or the second to last how, row? How can you ask if it's audible in the last row? If they can't hear you, they can't <laughs> hear you. It's not audible. Uh, well, there's no reply, so I guess it isn't. Um, this, this session uh, is uh, supposed to be about PCAL and TCAL, and uh, we were working over the breakfast table this morning, uh, trying to figure out the, the best way to do this. Um, I, I think to start with the history of the books is a good idea. Uh, so, uh, Sasha and I will uh, start off uh, telling you how we came to write the books, what the, uh, what the politics were at that time. And uh, then I would like to open it for questions, because that's my favorite, this <laughs> Q&A. Well, I was involved very early in the research in this area. In the PCAL, I say it was the Dole Chemical Company, but it's really the Dow Industrial Chem Chemistry Company where I worked. And uh, I was doing a great deal of psychedelic research there, synthesizing new compounds, finding their human activity. And uh, uh, all this inf information, since Dow did not wish to patent it, I put it into the scientific peer-reviewed literature. And they were becoming a little bit uncomfortable with my publishing human activity in psychedelic drugs, uh, with my return address being the Dow Chemical Company. I, I, please, uh, for a moment, I want to uh, mention that Dow Chemical is a very, very large company in the United States. Uh, so uh, this, um, uh, this has something to do with their discomfort. So I began, at their suggestion, publishing the information using my home address as my return address. And uh, that is why I decided to build my own laboratory behind the house at home. So shortly thereafter, I left Dow. I went for a couple of years to medical school and then decided to equip this laboratory in a way where I could continue my research there at home. And it was, it was a, a marvelous thing where you could have your own laboratory. You can sweep it out in the morning if you wish to. You can let it be dirty on the floor if you wish to. It's your laboratory. You may do with it as you wish. Describe it a bit. I'll describe it? Well, it's, it had a fireplace, which is very nice. Uh, so it'd be warm in the winter. Uh, had all the very m necessary and very inexpensive material, flasks, beakers, uh, test tubes, pipettes, were easy, easily uh, obtained, easily bought. And they really, the only uh, machinery I had there was a kugelroar and a um, vacuum pump and a um, uh, rotary evaporator. So this was my, my center for my research for, for quite a while. And uh, to assure that there would be no conflict with the government, I got a, uh, at that time, it was called the Bureau of Narcotics and Dangerous Drugs, a license. Actually, two licenses. It was a license to do research and a license to do analysis of uh, illegal drugs, which was fine. The, it turned out, though, the license to do research required, as a developed from transition from the uh, uh, narcotics dr drug uh, situation into the Drug Enforcement Administration, uh, the license, re they said to maintain a research license, you had to submit your research plans for approval. And I'm not of the spirit or the kind who wants approval for doing what I wish to do in research. So I gave the license back. I have no reason to having a research license. I'll do my own research on materials that are not illegal. And I kept publishing from my home, home address, in things like Nature and Journal of Medicinal Chemistry, Journal of Pharmacy, Pharmacology in England, uh, articles about the synthesis of new materials and their human activity. Uh, this was fine, but as things progressed and the more and more uh, publicity was made that was contrary to psychedelic drugs and to individual research in this area, I got into a, uh, some difficulty in, in pu getting published. Uh, the one of the first real objections was from the Pharmacy and Pharmacology Journal in England. Uh, apparently, the editors of the journal uh, had legal advice. And the advice was they really couldn't publish my work unless it had been approved by a research board, research board approval, a 
I forget the name of it, but it's some three-letter job, uh, a research approval. Uh, that's it. What IRB. is it? Institute Research. Institutional Research Board. That's Institutional uh, Research right. Board. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, we have a research group. Of, we confirm the activity of, of compounds in a group of 10 or 12 people. And so I appointed a physician there and a lawyer there and a psychiatrist there to form an internal research approval group. And we would have approval of our research by an internal research approval group. <laughs> uh, this was all right for a couple of years. And then it turned out that the lawyers recommended to the editors that it be an academic research group. And uh, this became awkward because we couldn't find a university who would allow us to use their name. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in short, it became increasingly difficult to make the discoveries, the information we had created publicly available. So why not put it in a book? So we devised the concept of a book PICAL for phenethylamines I have known and loved and contacted a very, very dear friend of ours in Los Angeles who was an uh, author and a publisher of this type of, of book. Uh, his name, Ann? Uh, it was Jeremy Tarcher. Jeremy Tarcher. And he'd already published, uh, was it uh, Tim Leary's? Tim Leary, a book on Tim Leary. Book, yeah, mm -hmm. uh, he was interested in that whole area. Mm -hmm. And so we sent him a copy of the book and he read it and uh, complimented, us, complimented us very, very nicely on it. He said it was a good book. But he also said, because of his content, no publisher would accept it. <laughs> so it, it, He said it was too political. That was his, his word. So we said, what the heck? We'll form a press. We'll call it Transform Press. The name appealed to me for obscure reasons. <laughs> and uh, we found that a lot of the people, the groups who publish magazines or books, are editors, but not printers. Some of the biggest publishing houses are editing houses, and they send their books to one of three or four large places that just do the printing and no editing. And we contacted one of these and said, if we sent you a, a type set proof uh, text of a few hundred or a thousand pages of a book, could you print it for us? And they said, yes, if you pay us. And we said, OK. <laughs> and so we put this all together and sent it out to be printed. We asked them to make it into a, a, a what do you call it, a spine-free um, paperback, a paperback okay, edition. Perfect bound. Perfect bound. Nothing's perfect. Not spiral. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, how many copies do you want? And we had the foggiest idea how many copies That's we right. wanted. Uh, when you do get a book into that thing, it is this much to do the printing, and then this much per copy. So the more copies you get, the, 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 the cost does not go up proportionate to the number of copies. And we really had no idea, would we sell two or 20 or 2,000? We did not know. Again, we had to find out that we do not have to open a bookstore, but there is a whole operation of giving, sending, assigning books to distributors who in turn find markets for them. And it's even more complicated than that in that we don't, didn't know who the distributors are, so you have to go to people who store the books and then give them to distributors who then send the books out from over here and then they tell you how much money you're going to get. <laughs> and, and then there's something called fulfillment. What, what? Fulfillment. Fulfillment. Oh yeah, that operation is called fulfillment, which is an unbelievable term. It's a, it's a company. Wait, 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 hold oh, it. Fulfillment. It. It's, it's a place where you store books. They store books for you. No rats, no mice, no insects, clean. And they have cases of books. So we had the printer, when the books were printed up, send them to the fulfillment. And then Anne's daughter, Wendy, bless her heart, became the person who would contact fulfillment and place orders, send 10 copies to so-and-so and three copies to so-and-so. But the fulfillment does not handle a penny of money. They are merely put stamps on things to send them out and send orders to us. So she had to send out all the invoices to the ultimate buyers. It was a complex picture, a book in itself, I think. This is more than you ever wanted to know about <laughs> self-publishing. <laughs> but, but you had asked about Pical and Tical, so this is really part of, part of the story. <laughs> I, I can't remember how much the first printing was. I believe it was something in the order of 5,000 copies, which we thought might be enough for a short while or it might be all, more than we'd ever need. We did not know. Mm -hmm. And uh, the next thing we realized is the 5,000 copies had been sold, so we got a second printer, printing of 20,000 copies. <laughs> 
and indeed, uh, it's now in its fifth printing, and it's still selling at a steady pace. Uh, and you want to go into the the four years, the beginning of the invasion, which is the a consequence of that printing. Yeah, that, uh, people um, often ask us when we had published Pical, the first book, uh, were we worried or, or frightened about uh, what might happen? Uh, and um, I remember um, after a long day, uh, uh, both of us lying in bed sp speculating. We do other things than speculate. That was just that. Was just that. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, we had a, a vague picture in, in our minds of uh, masked uh, intruders in the night. Um, breaking into the laboratory with baseball bats. <laughs> uh, that was probably the most paranoid uh, picture. But um, at the same time, the first people we had sent copies to uh, were people we knew in the DEA, the, or the chemists uh, in particular. So we felt uh, that there was a possibility uh, that the DEA would find this um, so interesting and even perhaps useful in some way uh, as, as a source of information uh, that maybe they wouldn't be too angry with us. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't quite work out that way, though, because <laughs> I still had a research, not a research, but a possession, a scheduled drug, a Schedule One drug uh, analytical license from right. the DEA. And, and just when a few years had gone by, I think two or three mm -hmm. uh, since the publication of the book, apparently uh, the book reached the, the top levels of the DEA in Washington, and they reacted. <laughs> uh, their reaction um, is what we call the day of the invasion, uh, which uh, became the first chapter of the second book. It, it was a very interesting experience, and we learned a great deal very fast. They, they wanted that, um, that uh, controlled substance uh, analytical license back, but they couldn't demand it back and grab it because I hadn't done anything naughty. So they snooped around, and they found by my infrared machine in basement four, basement four, in the back, in room, the back room, yeah. uh, in, uh, I had an infrared uh, spectrophotometer. And uh, lying around the infrared machine were something like 50 capsules and pills that I was going to run an infrared on to see what they were. And they said, from whom did these come? Yeah. Tell us their origins. I had no idea. I kept no record. I just collect, people gave me pills, these are being sold, what are they? And I get information, but I don't know t to whom to give the information. Uh, in fact, uh, Sasha really resented uh, the fact that people sent him these things <coughs> because uh, it was impossible to handle. Each person who, who sent uh, uh, an anonymous sample thought he was the only one sending a sample to Sasha. Well, so here were 30 or 50, I forget how many pills, and uh, they said, or capsules, things. And they said, you mean every one of these might be a Schedule One drug? And I said, I don't know, I haven't analyzed it yet. But they said, if it is a Schedule One drug and you don't know its origin, you, then you are the vehicle carrying a Schedule One drug. I said, yes, but I have an analytical license in my laboratory to do that. And they said, not for long. Sagt nicht mehr lange. The argument was, now every Transportation of an illegal material is a potentially a thirty-five or twenty-five thousand dollar fine, and so I multiplied twenty-five thousand times thirty or fifty, and I saw this could be a very awkward time. And so they said, very simple solution: all you do is to give us back, volunteer back your scheduled drug analytical license, promise not to accept any more anonymous pills, and pay us a fine of thirty of twenty-five thousand dollars. Well, this was a beginning of the, of the end of my relationship with the DEA. I had no $25,000 to give. I gave them the license. That was simple. And a dear friend of mine started a collecting, what do you call it? A, uh, a fund. A fund to yeah. raise the $25,000. Yeah. And to my amazement, within a month, we had that amount of money. And we paid the fine and told them to stop collecting money. Uh, there was uh, actually uh, a good side to this. 
because uh, while Sasha had a license from the DEA, uh, the DEA uh, had the right to come in at any time uh, to his laboratory um, without notice if they wished to do so and uh, uh, inspect, look at everything. But uh, once he gave his license back, uh, that their right to do that stopped. Uh, so um, at this point, I think that they have to uh, have uh, cause, um, uh, have official have a subpoena, legal cause. A subpoena of some kind to do it. All right, yeah, yeah. They have to have a legal subpoena or a legal warrant, uh, and they can no longer simply appear at our door and demand that we open it. There was another positive outgrowth of this also. It inspired us to write the second book, t <laughs> <laughs> So that is kind of the history of, of our getting into these books. Uh, the, uh, the attitude of uh, the DEA toward uh, Sasha uh, is something we have um, heard about over the years. Uh, a friend of ours um, overheard one of the top officials in the DEA uh, expressing uh, a strong desire uh, for Sasha to drop dead pretty soon. <laughs> but I'm sure he was just in a bad mood. Should I tell about the uh, Coventry? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there is a chapter in the third book. The we have Pikau, Tikau, and down the line there will be a third book, which I was going to name Quikau. Uh, yes. And Anne said, "No way whatsoever. <laughs> we'll make it called the third book." <laughs> and in this, uh, this will be a continuation of the first two. And one of the chapters I wrote for—I may have said this yesterday, but I don't think I did. One of the chapters I wrote for the third book was called Coventry. You didn't mention it. I did not. And uh, there is a phrase being sent to Coventry. In the United States, no one knows the phrase. It's totally uh, no, unknown. 99% of the people have never heard of the phrase. But in England, 99% uh, of the people know the phrase. And being sent to Coventry is from the time of George something or other, who was a Catholic and king of England, um. <laughs> who was established war against the Protestants of England. This is a cat. This is a, a religious thing. And all the Protestant soldiers, on seizing Catholic soldiers of the royalty, didn't really want to kill them because it wasn't very ethical in the Christian way. Und damals, um, als diese Russen war, wollten uh, die Soldaten. Your problem. <laughs> okay. And so what they did, they there was a very, very strongly. Um, Protestant city known as Coventry, and they would be sent to Coventry. And in Coventry, they were so anti-Catholic that the prisoners could, would not be talked to, and if the prisoners talked to anyone, they couldn't be heard. So in essence, it's a, a uh, sort of a, a isolation. isolation, total isolation yeah. from any communication with other humans. Should I go? I'll go into the, the Canadian thing, I think. It'd be yeah. Worth. Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> About... Two years ago, I was asked by the head of the Canadian counterpart of the American DEA, a person by the name of Lang, who was editing a book on, on uh, hallucinogenic drugs. And he was, uh, he asked if I would write a chapter reviewing the chemistry. I said, of course, and I wrote an 80-page chapter for him, which he found to be excellent, and he put it in the book. It's been published, Academic Press, and so that's a closed chapter, I thought. But he wrote, or he contacted me and said, I wish to thank you very much. He said, are you familiar, I think you're familiar with a group known as CLIC. And CLIC, C-L-I-C, is for Clandestine Laboratory Investigating Chemists. Well, they're, they're not investigating chemists, they are chemists who are investigating. And he said, I happen to be the president this year. And he said, you know, they are in a difficult place because none of the authorities in Washington will attend their meetings. And I said, why is that? He said, that's because you are a member. And one of my very best friends is a chemist for the DEA, and he's the founder of this group, and he invited me to be a member under my research institute name, which is uh, ASRI. I said, if I'm in any way bothering him or making him embarrassed, I will resign my membership. And he said, thank you, I accept your resignation. <laughs> said, now that you've resigned, I can tell you one more thing. The, your name has been 
is well known amongst the chemists in the DEA. There must be, I don't know, thousands of chemists. And they have been told that they cannot contact me. And if I contact them, they have to tell their boss and Washington. Namely, all these chemists in the DEA have been put in Coventry. <laughs> That's not the way they saw it, of course. <laughs> So sadly, I have lost contact with my friends in the, in the DEA. I don't dare embarrass them or put them in a compromised position by, by contacting them. And this, this is the stuff of a chapter in the third book called Coventry. <laughs> and uh, this is very much resented by uh, most of the chemists in the DEA uh, because they are not uh, political people. They are chemists. And they always uh, enjoyed hearing Sasha give a lecture. I'm a little bit manic and honest. <laughs> Well, <laughs> I guess. Um, the, the chemistry uh, in itself is fascinating to chemists. And uh, being cut off, uh, being not allowed to attend anything that Sasha uh, was at, uh, was uh, very disturbing to them, and uh, they were very angry about it. Uh, but they needed their jobs. And so uh, that that um, isolation um, of of Sasha, which is actually the isolation of the DEA chemists, uh, continues to this day. Yeah, the uh, an interesting uh, anecdote that fits in the same picture is uh, my return from uh, Palenque about what five years ago, perhaps eight years ago. No, close to five. Five. Uh, I had been asked before I went to Mexico by the people in the American Academy of Forensic Sciences if I would give a plenary address at the San Francisco International Meeting of the Academy. And they said nothing drug-wise, nothing sexy, just a technical scientific address. And so I said, certainly, I'll give a, a, uh, an address on the uh, interpretation of the fragmentation of uh, tryptamines by uh, GCMS. Simple things such as if it's N-substituted, the fragment is parent plus 6161, or it's 130 and 131. If it's unsubstituted, unless it's monosubstituted or disubstituted, which there is not a, not a, a thing. <laughs> 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 Never mind. Uh, I and uh, apparently I was told by a friend of mine that when I returned, uh, that the DEA had sent two people to the secretary, who is the program chairman of this group. And they told her that I should be disinvited because my appearance would be an embarrassment to the uh, uh, academy. And uh, they said this is because I was an indicted felon. I mean, to be a felon means you've been convicted of felony. And if you're indicted, you have not yet been convicted. So there's no meaning to being an indicted felon. Anyway, she said, look, he's already been, he's in the program, he's going to speak, and that's settled. And uh, I was told by a very good friend of mine who knows what goes on in the DEA, and he is my, one of my sources of information, that the verbal word went out to all chemists in the DEA that they, it didn't matter if they're at the meeting at their own expense or at company expense, or at their own time or on company time, that anyone who attended my lecture would be fired. And I noticed that a number of my friends who I knew were there did not attend my lecture. There's another little unit from the chapter uh, known as uh, Coventry. <laughs> and anybody here who has an informant for the DEA, please let them know that I'm aware of all these things. Jeder hier, der ein Informant für die Drogen ist. This this made me uh, both amused and very uncomfortable. Um, it it was amusing because they accomplished nothing. But I felt uncomfortable because it indicated a certain state of mind. And that state of mind um, in a, a, an official of the government uh, is rather uh, threatening. Their state of mind uh, might be described as uh, malicious and very resentful. And uh, one does not really want to have a government agency uh, feeling malicious and resentful against you. Uh, so even uh, though we laugh about this, it is, it is a very sad thing to have happened. I think maybe, would questions be appropriate? Would oh, questions we, we be would appropriate love to have uh, questions. We don't know what is the, the, where the interests are.
Mm -hmm. yeah. in, in the books. Uh, Josh? Third book. Book three. Book three. <laughs> when? <laughs> when? When is the third book going to be released? Well, I think we've both written several chapters for it and a yes. little bit of the, of the second half, the uh, uh, recipes and commentary. But I have been quite a bit diverted from it by this psychedelic index I talked about yesterday. Uh, also, um, at, at our age and also because we are very, very busy, uh, there has been less experimenting uh, um, sessions than there used to be. But perhaps if we would stop coming to beautiful places like Basel, <laughs> Uh, and continue to sit at our computers a little longer. Or get in the laboratory a little bit more. Or, uh, we would get the third book done as soon as possible, in other words. <laughs> there, there is another book that is annoying to me, and I have promised myself to write it. It's an, a book that I want to co-author with my friend Peyton Jacob. It's a book that's called FOC, which stands for Far Out Chemistry. <laughs> a state for, um... I found myself more and more often, this is over the last 40 years approximately, uh, that when I go through a chemical journal and I open a page and I see a dirty picture, I call these chemical structures dirty pictures, <laughs> and I look at the structure and I say far out. Uh, I have a suitcase in the back room in which I will make a copy of that page and put the copy in the suitcase. And so my dream is having a book co-authored with Peyton, and the title of the book would be FOC, Far Out Chemistry, and by, by Peyton and Sasha. And from the Peyton and Sasha. And the dream I had was going to an ACS meeting. This is American Chemical Society, a great big meeting twice a year. And the, you get a card table for, I know, some amount of money that you can sell things at to the people who are at the meeting, and just put out 100, 200, 5,000 copies of this FOC book and have a sign overhead that said, pick up a book at, and open at a random page. And if you don't say to yourself, far out, <laughs> close the book and go on. <laughs> now, the, the, the difficulty is I have this suitcase that is bulging full with 40 years of far out <laughs> Xeroxes, and I'd just like to finish that someday, but I don't know when. <laughs> No, and that answers your question. <laughs> it, it's known as uh, so much to do and so little time. Yes. Okay, next question. Uh, the stats far left. Uh, have you ever considered doing research on salvinorines in the same way you do research uh -huh. phenytalamines and tryptamines? So we, we could maybe Salve expect to book Zika, salvinorines and Salvia divinorum? Yeah. Ah. Mit, uh, yes. Untersuchung mit Sa Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, whole area of Salvia Davinorum uh, has a bit of history that involves uh, Hoffman. Many years ago, I'd say probably about 1960 or a little bit earlier, I was given a living fragment of a plant that was called Salvia Divinorum. This is why I was working at Dow. And I found out some time later that Albert Hoffman had received a living plant, a copy of the same plant, while he's working at Sandoz. And I built out behind Dow Chemical Company by the parking lot a little greenhouse. And Albert built out behind Sandoz near the parking lot a small greenhouse also. <laughs> and we both put cuttings of the plant in pots in the greenhouse, he in Switzerland and I in the United States. And we raised a quantity of leaves. He is basically uh, oriented toward uh, chromatography. I'm basically oriented toward spectroscopy. But we took the leaves and analyzed them. And neither of us found anything of interest. <laughs> Because we, we were told, both of us, we didn't know each other at that time. It was, it was 10 years later we exchanged comments. We found we had both done almost identical things at the same time. And even more than that, since we were told it's orally active, I consumed a large quantity of it orally, and he consumed a la large amount of it orally, and we both got very sick and vomited, but no turn on. No one told it you had to get it in the mouth and get it through the gums and sublingually. We were just told it's orally active. And so we both assumed it was all fraud, and we ignored the whole thing and, and went on to with other, other things to do. Well, it turns out that the active material is only active through the, through the mouth and absorbed, you know, chew up leaves, even numbers of leaves always, for a period of time, and you absorb through the buccal tissue of the mouth the active material. And uh, 
we, and it's not an alkaloid, we would have looked for the wrong thing. We assumed uh, active materials in plants are alkaloids, and this is not an alkaloid. But it was an interesting point in common that uh, when I met Hoffman some 10 years later, that we share, uh, that I, I met him some 10 years later, we share these, these interesting memories. <laughs> that comes to mind. Thank you for the question on salvia debinorum. <laughs> okay. Other questions? Front here. Uh, you've mentioned a few times now that you have uh, friends within the DEA, particularly at the chemistry group, who um, have respect for your just publishing accurate information to, uh, in the interest of public safety. Are there people in more political areas in the DEA who support a uh, harm reduction approach and would like to have, would like people to have just good information on drugs that people are going to use regardless of whether or not they're illegal? No. Gibt es auch, um, <laughs> the word is no. Yes. The answer is no. Uh, yeah. uh, you mentioned that there is no communication now between anyone in the DEA and with me. It's their problem, but that is they have to live with that. And the higher echelon in the, in the uh, DEA is extraordinarily conservative and not friendly at all. The, the term um, harm reduction uh, is one of the most unpopular in the DEA. And this sounds very strange to us uh, until you realize that the people, the average uh, person in the DEA is not at all interested in whether the laws are good or whether psychedelics, for instance, um, are good drugs. Um, and the fact that psychedelics are not addictive. Uh, these things do not interest them. The only things that are important to DEA people uh, are the laws. And uh, catching people uh, who, um, who break those laws. Uh, so uh, all the arguments in the world about harm reduction are of no interest to them, which is really a great shame. Um, I was wondering if either of you had ever encountered uh, the use of smoked 5 meo DMT for therapeutic purposes, particularly relieving psychosomatic symptoms? Um, I haven't heard of that at all. Something it's very interesting. Yeah? Uh, this, for me, personally, the, the first time I tried it, I had a cold, which disappeared the moment I inhaled and didn't come back. And then from that point on, I had some of it. Any time I had a friend over who had a headache or a toothache, <coughs> anything really. <laughs> That's just my experience. Um, the, the, there's a strange uh, thing about uh, MDMA that I discovered. Uh, when it was still legal and I was taking it, uh, if I was beginning uh, the symptoms of a cold, if I took MDMA uh, within the first 12 hours, uh, the cold disappeared and did not return. So maybe we should get together and open a clinic of some sort. So it would be like that. Any other questions over here? Yeah. Um, yes, that's a very, very interesting question. I don't think anybody knows uh, the answer to that one, uh, but I, I suspect that uh, especially psychedelic chemists um, would be aware of the fact that they, um, they are participating in a mutual discovery. I, and uh, to illustrate this, there, there is uh, a theory that when the atomic bomb was uh, discovered, uh, the, the balance, the, the spiritual balance uh, was kept uh, by the beginning of uh, psychedelic drug discoveries. I like to think that that is true. <laughs>
denkt und ich möchte denken, dass dies wahr ist. What, what kind of substance is it? Or also, beta carbolines or maybe opioids. Uh, as far as the chemicals in the new book, it'll be more of a psychedelic mess. No, 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 opi no opioids or other things. Uh, cactus. Cactus alkaloids, yes. Yeah. And it's amazing how many psychedelics have emerged in, uh, from the from the community at large over the last two decades. I get a continuous flow of information from people around the world that would say, did you realize if you put a methyl group here instead of there, you have a psychedelic that is twice as active uh, that it would otherwise be. So I have a very delicate problem in making this information public because I don't want to use the person's name because the person not, does not wish to be attached to this information. And yet, if I make it anonymous, it has no credibility. So really all I can do is go in the laboratory and make up the compound and treat it as if it were a brand new compound with the same precaution I would treat any new compound. And this is one of the beauties of being here. I've talked to two or three of these people who have been sources of information. And they have come up, introduced themselves, and said, you have gotten my information. And I said, I have indeed. I thank you very much. May I use your name in the new index book as a source of information? And the response has always been very much the same. Mm, no. <laughs> so I really don't know how to, how to handle this information. I would love to have an anonymous page. I may send it all on to Arrowhead anonymously. Uh, uh, I should add, though, um, in partial answer to that question, that we now have uh, two, three hillsides full of uh, cacti. Large, small, medium. Uh, so I think there are going to be some things discovered in, uh, in these cacti which will be published. I got a very nice mailing from a person, uh, he's a European person, but the mailing was from uh, Argentina. He said in the northwestern part of Argentina, the, he found several hills covered with a certain Trichocerus cactus that had not been analyzed. And he sent me a powder that was the extract of that cactus. And I looked at it by GCMS, and there were seven major peaks, of which six I could immediately identify. He said, I was totally in love with that part of Argentina and was thinking of buying 2,000 acres, so I'd, I'd have a laf lifetime supply of this fantastic cactus. <laughs> so that's a, I know. And interestingly, the major component of the cactus was N-methylmescaline, which has never been assayed in man. Mescaline is active and well-known. Dimethylmescaline has been tried in man is not active, but monomethyl has never been assayed. It would be immediate target to make the, easily made, to make the compound and taste it. Except, in my opinion, the second major compound present was mescaline, which took a little bit of the, of the impetus away from making the other compound and trying it out, but I would like to do it. <laughs> Someday I will. <laughs> okay, more? Yeah. Uh-huh. <coughs> We send the books out at about a little less than half the retail value. That's all the money we get for them. Right. And the difference is the profit to the bookstore. But we found that by the time you sold about two-thirds of a printing, you recovered your money for the printing and the, the rest of the sale will go toward the next printing. This, for this reason, we've kept the price on both books as low as possible which refunds us our investment and allows a little bit of uh, accumulation for a, a further printing. By the way, this is not a, a, a forbidden question. This, this is a legitimate business question. Yeah? Far, far. I have a question. What's the recipe of your loving relationship? <laughs> 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 oh. Um, that's a serious question. <laughs> 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 
Um, a, a commitment is the, the first the first thing. Um, the second thing is uh, never put your mate down uh, in public or in private. Uh, have great respect for each other at all times. And I speak from uh, quite a lot of experience because I was married three times before I met him. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't know. That, that's not something to applaud. <laughs> yeah, uh, first of all comes, comes love. And trust. And trust, and trust yeah. Vertrauen. And respect. And the respect. And commitment. That's the best I can tell you. Uh, have you got an official internet site so that you could put bits and pieces even unfinished over there so that for a broad public it would be available just, uh, just like that or not? Have you got an internet site? Uh, you mean a, a website? Yes, website. Uh, other people have made websites for us. We don't have one. I think uh, the, the, the main argument against it is the time it would take. I mean, you have to uh, keep your website current, don't you? You when should. Uh, that, that takes quite a lot of time. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you have a good argument why we should, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, just a direct contact to you, if you like it or not like it. So I, I sent an email to Sasha, uh -huh. so that he had to reply. But if any standard questions are from, coming from anywhere, so that you could Put it all on your website, hmm. and that is that. Okay. Uh, any specific questions, people could contact you. Yeah. Which people you think would profit from knowing? Yeah, there, there is, a, there is an answer to that. Uh, Sasha has been writing a, a column called "Ask Dr. Shulgin." Um, CCLE. That's the. He's writing it for the Center for Cognitive Liberty e. E. and Ethics. Oh, that's ethics. It. okay. C C L E, uh, who are a wonderful uh, group of people. No, and um, unfortunately, uh, he has be become so busy that uh, the the answers have fallen behind. But uh, that, that is exactly what you were talking about. Uh, the, the column um, answers usually one or two uh, major questions. About what, once a month or? About once a month, yes. Once a month. Uh, we have to catch up with it. About 200 questions a month. <laughs> uh, but but uh, 200 questions a month coming in uh, takes a lot of time. Yeah. And uh, at our age uh, also, we have to... Uh, um, Parcel out our energy uh, carefully, you know. And if you want to write and finish a book, uh, that's where your energy has to go. Yeah, uh, gentleman in back. Yeah. Yeah. Um, aside from moving to Northwest Argentina or a beautiful place like Basel, Switzerland, do you have any hopeful thoughts for those of us still living in the Tiananmen Square of Paris? Because it's a very terrible regime. Yeah, uh, uh, join the societies, the um, organizations that are fighting for um, uh, modification or repeal of the drug laws. Uh, if, if you send them your money and your, your um, thoughts and your energy, uh, they will be more and more effective. Uh, uh, to, what is drug it? Alliance, Drug Policy Alliance. The Drug Policy Alliance and uh, the CCLE. Uh, these are two very, very uh, good uh, and effective organizations. Although uh, we probably will have to wait another three years before uh, there's some hope in um, this area. Or three, or three decades at the rate it's going. <laughs> no, I'm an optimist. In front. Could either of you share an epiphany that you've had in your lifetime? Uh, epiphanies, I think we probably had quite a few. Which particular ones are you interested in? <laughs> oh gosh, that's a difficult one. Yeah. 
Yeah, if you have any epiphany, you I can't even spell the word. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, did you want to translate that? <laughs> Yeah, there, there, there are some, but I, I think I'm going to word them carefully and put them in the next book. It's a heavy question. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> it's a good one. Uh, any on this side? Right, right dead center. Uh, this is, yeah. Oh, thank you. Um, in retrospect on your experience as researchers, um, what tips or do's and don'ts uh, would you uh, recommend or give to researchers which now start their career, career are at the beginning. First, first know the laws. Yeah, that's a, a very good thing to have in, in your mind is the exact wording of the, fe, of the federal and state law. Uh, in the United States, uh, they passed a very quietly a subtle law called the um, Analog Drug Bill, the Federal Analog Drug Bill. Uh, and the bill defines an analog in an extremely ambiguous way. Uh, it says that an analog is a material that is substantially similar to a scheduled drug. And I know the meaning of substantially the same, and I know the meaning of similar. But I don't know what substantially similar means. And very carefully, as with many aspects of vague law, they don't define the term substantially similar. But uh, they do say that if you a, uh, sell or make available to a person a material that's substantially similar, or you wish to induce an effect that is substantially similar to that of a scheduled drug, uh, then you can be tried in court for under the drug laws. And this is, this is a, a, a point in which they can interpret the meaning of substantially similar as they choose to in court. When I was still doing expert witness testimony uh, in the United States up to about 10 years ago, I was asked by a lawyer to appear in a court down near Los Angeles where a person who was being charged with an analog on the, on the analog drug bill. And I was asked by the uh, prosecuting attorney, does this chemical have a structure that is substantially similar to that chemical? And that ke chemical was a Schedule I drug, and this chemical had no legal standing at all. So I turned to the judge, who was an old man like me, and I said, Your Honor, I don't understand the question. And so the judge asked the prosecuting attorney, could you rephrase the question? But he couldn't because he had to follow the letter of the law. So he asked me another question. Does this material have an action that is substantially similar to this material? So I asked the judge, I don't understand the question. <laughs> and the judge asked the prosecutor, can you rephrase the question? And uh, he said, I can't because that's the wording of the law. So I said, I can't answer the question, so goodbye. And I left the court. <laughs> One more phrase. But I have to add one more thing. It ended on a very interesting, almost humorous, sad, humorous note. When I was out, they brought in a forensic chemist from that area, and in the voir dire, I don't know what voir dire is in German. Voir dire? Uh, it, before a person becomes an, a, a, a witness, mm -hmm. they ask him name, background, oh, right. all information, nothing to do with a, with a trial, mm -hmm. but just background. Mm -hmm. called voir dire in the United States. And um, during voir dire, she was asked, do you know the meaning of the term substantially similar? And she said, absolutely, yes. She said, all chemists know the term. Said, Two things are substantially similar if they're over 50% over identical. <laughs> okay, <laughs> two things. Are these two things over 50% identical? They're both made of paper. They're absolutely identical. They're both made of paper products. I think the last question. Yeah, maybe. Uh, the, the, the orange first. Uh, yes, I want to know uh, how did you work with MDMA in psychotherapy when you worked uh, with um, The best way to answer you is, is that I, I put as much as I could of the entire uh, therapeutic process, uh, particularly involving MDMA, uh, although other uh, real, true psychedelics were also used. Uh, in the second book, uh, Tikal, especially in the chapter called, I think it was, The Intensive. Uh, so the best way to answer you is um, beg, borrow, 
or steal a copy. <laughs> <laughs> you might get some answers at that. I think it's lunchtime. <laughs> um, if, if there are no more urgent questions, we should let you have lunch. Oh, no. there's an urgent question. <laughs>